everyone. Sorry for the delay, but thank you for joining our webinar today for Unstuck and on Target, Improving Executive Function on Task and Flexible Behavior. Today, our co-presenters will be Ms. Lynn Cannon and Dr. Lauren Kenworthy. Um, so let's just go start, let's get started. We'll be giving a CE certificate today. Um, if you're watching this live, you'll get it with email to you within the next 24 hours. If you join us by phone or on demand, be sure to take the CE quiz in our archive folder and you will receive your certificate. Don't forget to join our free community, Teaching All Students, which is at edweb.net slash inclusive education. Stay up there for updated resources, upcoming webinars, and other online discussions. We'll also be promoting a 20% off discount with Brooks Publishing. The code is edwebLC, and that is good till October 31st, 2018. You get 20% off all products on our website. And like I mentioned earlier, we'll be doing a giveaway, so make sure you stay active in the chat. We're gonna give away one free copy of the Unstuck and Untarget kit, and we'll announce the winner at the end. So without further delay, here are our co-presenters. Ms. Lynn Cannon, she is a social learning specialist at Ivy Mount School in the Maddox School. She received her master's of education in special ed from the University of Virginia. And she has 15 years experience working as an educator, administrator, and program director, serving schools with, I'm sorry, serving students with neurodevelopmental disabilities. And um, we also have Dr. Lauren Kenworthy. She's professor of neurology, pediatrics, and psychiatry at the George Washington University School of Medicine and director of the Center for Autism Spectrum Disorders at the Children's National Health Center. I'm sorry, health system. So let's get this presentation started. You can learn from these um, experts in the autism field. All right. So hello, my name is Lauren. Um, as, as you just heard, I'm really excited to be doing this. Um, and I want to start by saying that although you're going to hear from, from me, Lauren Kenworthy, and also from Lynn Cannon, that we're going to be talking about um, Unstuck and on Target, which has five authors. And uh, Katie Alexander um, is an occupational therapist. Monica Warner is a school administrator and counselor. And Laura Anthony is a clinical psychologist. And all five of us together uh, built the Unstuck and on Target um, curriculum. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons why it works is because it's really the result of a multidisciplinary team. And I also just wanted to orient you. You heard some um, about this, the kits, which will be given away. Um, and that's the Unstuck and Untarget kit. It's down here on the right uh, bottom side of your screen. Um, and that's published by Brooks, um, along with this book above it called Solving Executive Function Challenges. I tend to refer to this as the blue book, even though only the top little part of it is actually blue. But this is a companion um, volume. And while the Unstuck and Untarget curriculum uh, down here in the bottom is what you use to run a small group, whether it's at school or in a clinic or somewhere else, the, the uh, Solving Executive Function Challenges book here on the top, this is a companion manual that helps a parent or a teacher or a therapist use the self-regulatory scripts, the vocabulary that is at the core of Unstuck um, in their daily lives. So it can be used in, along with the intervention. It can be used on its own, um, but it's really meant for somebody who's not gonna run a group, but is gonna want to model these unstuck and on target um, strategies and vocabulary in the everyday life. Okay, so. Um, the, Lynn and I have a goal today, and that is we wanted to increase your understanding of executive functions and how to enhance them. And our plan for doing that is to start by talking a little bit about what are executive functions. And I'll focus on the fact that they're fractionated or broken up into pieces and also plastic or malleable that they can change. And then I'll talk about why they matter. And then we'll dive into talking about some specific aspects of executive functioning um, and how you accommodate them. And um, following that, we'll get into some of the meat of the unstuck curriculum in terms of how we treat executive function problems in autism, but also now in ADHD. So the first point we wanna make is just that executive functions, um, which are defined as a brain-based ability that enables us to carry out goal-directed behavior are really a series of things. Um, they they um, 
there's a set of things that we do that make us efficient and effective in uh, setting and achieving goals and making plans. And one part of what we do is behavior regulation, like impulse control. Another part is emotion regulation. Um, and that turns out to have a lot to do with um, cognitive flexibility as well as just regulating our feelings. And then the third part is cognitive regulation, regulating our thinking, holding information and working memory, making plans, organizing and integrating information. So all of these together make up executive functions. And that's why we say it's fractionated. And the important message for you here is that um, you can think about um, executive functions and executive function interventions, but really you're probably thinking about some specific aspects of executive functioning. So for instance, if you're a person who's working with the CogMed online training, that's working specifically on working memory. Um, if you um, you know, have a child who's on a stimulant medication, that's targeting some of those inhibition and uh, uh, skills as well as attention. Um, but there's many different aspects of executive functioning. And then the second point is that executive functioning is malleable. And I think this is um, one reason why it's so exciting that we heard that like 2,000 people signed up for this webinar, which really got me and Lynn going, because um, the cool thing about Unstuck and On Target is it's an intervention that's designed to intervene in an area where kids are changing. Um, the, the executive functions rely on these prefrontal subcortical circuits in our brain that mature over the first three decades of life. So there are very long-term um, developmental project. And that means that if you have a second grader or an eighth grader or even a 12th grader that you're working with, you are going to be intervening on a on an area where they're still developing skills. It's very different from a brain perspective than, say, language, where a lot of that um, jello, if you will, is set by five or six. Um, the other thing about their malleability is that they mean that they change a lot. Um, you know, kind of day to day, they can be influenced by many different um, things in our environment. Um, and that can help us to kind of have empathy and to realize what it's like to have bad executive functions kind of day to day, because most of us have had a bad executive function day. If you uh, haven't gotten enough sleep, if you didn't eat your breakfast, if you're really worried about a sick relative, all those things will make your executive functions worse. Um, and I think, you know, most all of us on this webinar uh, are plenty smart enough to grocery shop. We know how to do that. But we may not do it in a very efficient way because we're having trouble with our executive functions. So for instance, if I go to the store on a day after I haven't gotten a lot of sleep um, or I haven't eaten my breakfast, I will find myself in the cookie aisle munching on Milano cookies before I've even thought about why I came to the store. And that's because my impulse control isn't as good as it should be. And then I might also find myself um, in, in the produce aisle, um, really excited to get some pears because I make a really good pear tart. And then I see these pears that are really unripe and hard as rock. And I will get a little inflexible at that moment. And I will be stuck on how bad the produce here in the DC Washington DC area where I live is and how expensive and overpriced it is and really what's going on. And until I can be flexible and shift and say, I'm going to make apple pie instead, I'm kind of wasting my time and I'm going to end up being slower in that store um, than I should be. And I may also have trouble in the store because I'm not regulating my thinking well. Maybe I'm not keeping track in working memory of what I've already put in the cart and what I need to put in the cart. Maybe I'm not making a good plan for what it is that I wanted to buy and eat that week um, in advance so I know what it is I need to pull off the shelves. Maybe I'm not using the organization of the store. So I'm picking up the strawberries and then heading over to the dairy section to get the cheese and then realizing I have to go back to get the beans. So. That's just to say that when we talk about executive function, it can help to think about um, our own experiences of when this works well and when it doesn't. And when we have a student who shows up at school for the ninth time without their homework and with no lunch, and really you've already completely given up on them ever having the permission slip for the field trip, then we can remember that some of those problems they're having are related to their difficulties with executive functions. So 
I want to move on from saying that those are the multiple components of executive function, that we can change them, and to saying why we think they're so important. And here, I want to talk about how necessary executive functions are for so many things we do every day. And when they were first kind of discovered and discussed, not that long ago in the 1960s, Toyberg described executive dysfunction as the curious dissociation between knowing and doing. And what he meant was that there's plenty of people who know a lot, who have a lot of knowledge, who are very uh, smart or verbal or whatever it may be, but they don't show what they know. They have trouble with the doing part of it. And that is the crux of executive functions. So executive functions, when we research them, and we've done this in people with autism and people with ADHD and people with all kinds of disorders, we see that it relates to your adaptive daily living skills. Can you get out of the house in the morning? Do you remember that it's important to wash your face before you go to school? To your learning, it's directly related to academic achievement you know, around math and reading. To your sense of control of your own life, do you manage your life to the stress of the family members around you and to adult outcomes. And um, folks like Phil Salazzo have done really striking work showing that your executive functions when you're a little kid actually predict the likelihood of you ending up in jail as an adult. And that's after you account for socioeconomic status. So they're really powerful drivers of many important um, real world uh, uh, behaviors. And then uh, the other reason that we think executive functions are so important to understand for kids is because they lead to this confusion between what a child can't do and what a child won't do. And especially if you have a kid who knows a lot and has all these great ideas, but doesn't ever seem to get them onto paper or has a huge vocabulary, but can't express um, the, that they've learned and remembered what you've taught them. It's very easy to think about that child as choosing not to do things. So if you go back to that grocery store example, there I am in the produce aisle and I'm looking kind of stubborn about those pears and how bad they are. And if the, um, the uh, store clerk walks up to me and I start being really grouchy about how crappy their produce is, then I'm actually starting to look a little bit oppositional, right? But really, I'm cognitively stuck. I can't shift. And I'm not going to be able to be helped or to get better at this problem unless somebody thinks about this as a can't and where I need some strategies and techniques as opposed to a won't where I basically need to be told I'm not such a good person. We all know that for kids, when they hear from the adults around them that they're stubborn or self-centered or don't want to try, they're going to internalize that. And that's going to lead to those long-term self-esteem issues. So distinguishing can't from won't turns out to be a huge and powerful tool we have to help people with executive dysfunction. And it's also why it's so important to get on this early. And I spoke a little bit at length about that. Now I want you to hear from somebody um, who is autistic. Uh, Julia Bascom is the executive director of the Autism Self-Advocacy Network. And um, she is, I think, so much more articulate than I am at expressing what this can't versus won't is like. So uh, Edward, if we could have the video, please. One of the really important things um, that I needed to learn very early um, was that there are things that I can't do. Um, and I think that a lot of times families are, are hesitant to say that because you don't want someone to limit themselves and certainly people with disabilities often have limits placed on us because of what other people assume we can't do. So you want to avoid that. Um, but if you don't know what you can't do, then what you end up with is this list of things that you won't do or that you don't want to do or that you try to do but they never quite work out. Um, and it can feel like there's something wrong with you and if you just tried harder or if you were just better, you would be able to do them. Um, and when you know that you can't do something, it helps in a few different ways. First of all, it, it sort of clarifies that like this is a disability issue and this is part of your disability. It's not that you're lazy or unmotivated, it's that you actually have um, a really hard time with something that other people don't have a hard time with. And that's important to know. Um, because it doesn't go away if you pretend that that's not true. You're still going to have a hard time with it. 
Um, so you need to know that. And then once you know that there's a problem, you can come up with a solution. You can come up with a workaround. If you're not admitting that there's a problem or that there's something that you can't do, you're going to keep trying the same thing over and over and over again. So you want to be able to say, this is what I can do. This is what I need help with. This is what I need in order to succeed. And then from there, you can figure out accommodations and supports. So I hope um, you all could hear that. I, I think um, Julia is such a wonderful um, advocate for what this experience is. That video um, and another one you'll see later in the presentation are from an online set of training modules that the Unstuck authors have developed for parents. They're really taking that Solving Executive Functions book that I showed you at the beginning and putting them into online training modules. And that's going to be another nice tool to be a companion for people who are running the Unstuck curriculum. Um, which is the what the uh, book that tells you how to run the small groups to teach these skills to kids that Lynn's going to tell you a lot more about in a minute. Okay, so executive functions matter. Now let's dive in and talk about some of those specific aspects of executive functions. These are the ones that are targeted most effectively by the Unstuck and Untarget curriculum. Um, and I wanna pause here and say, you know, we did develop this originally for people who had autism. And uh, then as you'll hear later, we ran a trial for people who had ADHD. And what we're finding is that this curriculum helps people who have flexibility, organization, planning, working memory problems. So it really doesn't matter what label is slapped on the kid or the young adult. It's really more about um, whether or not you want to address problems related to these areas, flexibility, organization, and planning. That's how you pick the kid who will benefit from this intervention. Um, and so I'm going to dive in here and say that I'm going to describe these um, specific domains, flexibility, organization planning, working memory. And I'm going to talk about, before I talk about how you would fix it, I'm going to talk about how you accommodate those problems. And the reason that I'm uh, doing that is that it is the philosophy of all of the unstuck authors that it is important to accommodate before you try to remediate. You have to provide accommodations before people are able to learn. And there's two primary reasons for that. One is because it's the right thing to do. Just as we know we're a stronger country because we include all races and all uh, ethnicities, we are also stronger for including all types of brains. Um, Leonardo da Vinci is an example of somebody who people think had a lot of symptoms of ADHD, but the fact is that we're really glad that he was there to contribute to our, our culture. Um, and, you know, companies now are starting to understand this pretty well. Um, many companies are setting quotas for saying that they want to hire 1% of their workforce who's autistic, for example, because we are better and stronger when we include everyone. The other reason that accommodation is so important is one that you're all very familiar with, which is that overwhelmed people can't learn, right? None of us learn when we are completely overwhelmed. And so we need to have some key accommodations in place before we try to do that teaching of the skills um, that children um, will be able to benefit from. And we're going to talk about um, sort of six major categories of accommodations over here on the right, can't, not, won't, predictability, making the big picture explicit, talking less and writing more, avoiding overload and keeping it positive. These are by no means all the accommodations you can think of. These are just some key ones that Lynn and I want to be sure to hit on. So I'm going to start by talking about flexibility for the child who has flexibility problems. And as I said, this could come with a diagnosis of autism. It could it affects about half of the kids who have ADHD diagnoses. It comes up in kids with anxiety. For those kinds of kids where flexibility is an issue, then we're going to want to think about whether or not we can first understand the cognitive underpinnings of their problems. And here, there's a lot of research I could show you um, that you know, describes cognitive flexibility and what it looks like um, in kids um, with autism and other disabilities. But I think this um, student, who is actually a, a previous student of Lynn's, uh, kind of said it best. He described that um, what he called Asperger's was like having a vice on his brain. And each unexpected event is like another turn on the vice. And it just keeps building until you feel like you're going to explode. And sometimes when you explode, it comes out the wrong way. 
And there's a couple key things I think about what this wise young man said. And one is he's describing a metal vice. He's describing a metal vice on his head that's getting tighter each time he has to be flexible. That sounds to me like torture, right? That's a physical sensation that he has. This is not coming out of a won't or a stubborn, I don't want to do this. This is, I'm having real cognitive trouble with this. And then he describes this thing that I feel like a lot of you have seen in kids that you work with or, uh, you know, love or otherwise have in your life. And it's this phenomenon where kind of each additional request to be flexible kind of builds up in somebody. Um, and you see them getting kind of increasingly uneasy until they let it out the wrong way. So that's what cognitive flexibility looks and feels like. And then the question is, um, how do we see it from the outside? This is a list of behaviors. These are some of the common things that somebody can say, uh, somebody can do that may indicate that they are underneath struggling with cognitive flexibility. They can be somebody who doesn't stop doing something even when they're told to stop. They can be somebody who's not good at accepting feedback. These are very irritating behaviors. And most of us see these kinds of things and think, why won't that kid just behave better? right? And so at that point, it's important to stop and think about whether that's actually a won't or a can't. Because um, if it's a can't, then we're in a different position. Then we can stop and think about how do we turn that into a can? How can we intervene here to help that child learn skills to be more flexible? Um, versus a won't, we're going to think about, well, that kid needs a consequence, right? But it really won't do us good to keep a kid in from recess if they are stuck on a detail such that they can't stop asking you about it, even when it's annoying. Um, at that point, we need to teach them a new skill and also provide some key accommodations. And here's a list of just some of the struggles that people who are inflexible have. This is the kind of problem that they run into. They have difficulty when their expectations are violated. They're more rigid about what they think is going to happen in terms terms of following rules, they get overwhelmed by intense feelings. A lot of you have seen these kind of behaviors and these can be these can't behaviors that need an accommodation. And you can see here, there's a lot of different things and I bet you many of you already are doing a lot of these things. You know that you need to post a schedule, a very specific routine about what's gonna happen each um, day in school and why. And um, the story that I have here is about the kid who came home from the last day of school um, and slapped his school schedule up on the fridge. You know, the kind of thing that says we have reading at nine and then we have um, a, a five minute break and then we go to math and then it's recess. And he put it up on the fridge and he looked to his mom and he said, okay, I'm ready for summer. And his point was, I need to know when things are gonna happen and I need, need to have it be scheduled. And that helps me, that helps my inflexible brain. Um, I hope you guys are noticing one thing about this list. There's one thing that comes up in every category as being an important um, accommodation, right? It's this flexible adult. And I think this is the kind of um, thing that we have all seen how important this can help. Um, this can be to help people uh, who have brain-based inflexibility. They need a flexible adult. Most of us have seen situations where an inflexible adult encounters an inflexible kid and the whole thing kind of spirals downward in a negative way. And so recognizing um, how to be more flexible yourself and helping other people to recognize how they can build their flexibility skills is an important um, issue. And it's addressed in the beginning of the Unstuck and Untarget curriculum, um, the, the full kit. Um, has a really nice section that Lynn and Katie did helping people think about, am I a flexible adult and what could I do to be more so? Um, I also want to remind you that for each of these areas, um, there are strengths that come, right? So there are things that are harder that, you, that people have trouble doing or they can't do where they need accommodations and teaching. There are also good aspects to this. Inflexible people tend to be more persistent, often reliable, loyal. They know how to use routines and they can develop deep set data sets. In addition, there's, it's important to recognize that their inflexibility can be adaptive. And this is something that we learned from um, people who have inflexibility problems themselves, explaining that sometimes they need to be inflexible in order to limit how many unexpected overloading things happen. 
and you saw that in that description of the vice, right? They need to not get to the point where they just let it out the wrong way. That's not going to work, right? So recognizing that we need to respect that kid who says, I cannot sit in the lunchroom. I will be so overwhelmed. I will lose my ability to regulate my behavior. I might become more impulsive. I might become more anxious. I might become more um, in, inflexible and, and repetitive. So there are good things in inflexibility as well as challenges. And if we provide that key accommodation around predictability and structure and warning people when something's going to change as much as we can and providing um, as much clear routines as possible, then we are doing going a long way to putting in what I think of as the wheelchair ramp, right? We don't expect the kid in a wheelchair to crawl up the steps of school each day in order to get to class. We know that they need a ramp. They need that accommodation so they can be ready to learn when they do get to school and not exhausted, right? And so for the inflexible brain, some of those wheelchair ramps are around the predictability and structure that we can provide. I want to move on and talk about organization and integration because this is another um, big area um, of, of difficulty that can have major repercussions on people's executive functions and behaviors at school. And here I'm actually going to show you a um, tool that we use. I'm trained as a pediatric neuropsychologist. So I um, see people in my office and they come in because they have problems in their real world, um, kids, you know. so. Uh, a common one that I see is that seven or eight or nine year old boy who um, seems to have a big vocabulary, but he just doesn't write at school. Right. Um, and in and the example I'm going to show you, that's exactly what the case was. And he was on his teacher's last nerve because he clearly had a lot of good ideas and he was not putting them down on paper. So when I'm trying to figure out what's going on there in my quiet, you know, highly structured office, I do things like pull out this figure and I ask kids to copy it. And what I'm doing is presenting them with a lot of information that's novel. They haven't seen it before. Executive functions are always in more demand when it's something that you haven't seen or worked with before. Um, and also that's complex. There's a lot of pieces to it and that requires a lot more executive function skills. And then I ask them to copy it. So they have to integrate the, the visual and the motor. And so I put it in front of the kid and I say, copy this. And this is what this little boy who came in because he wasn't writing for his um, third grade teacher did for a copy. And um, I think it's a pretty good job, right? This looks like this. Um, despite the fact that he's got not very good motor control, he's able to get a lot of this figure um, just like it was shown to him. So that shows that he's a smart kid with good visual perceptual skills, which is lucky that we could show that because this kid at nine was a math genius already. He was meeting with the chairman of the Georgetown math department <laughs> to share ideas. So clearly he's got a lot of cognitive horsepower and ability to understand abstract visual information. But I was giving him the test because I wanted to know about his executive organization and integration skills. And that's why you see different colored pencils here, because I was looking at the process by which he copied this complex figure, not the outcome. I knew he was good with visual materials. And that's why you can see that the, the colors tell me where he started and what he did next. So he started with the green pencil and then he did the blue pencil and then the black. Now, if I put this in front of you, I don't think you would have approached it this way. Most people, when they see a lot of complicated information like this, are likely to start with the big picture, the base rectangle, the diagonal lines. Maybe they'll go in, they'll make that X, and then maybe they'll make the cross, the big vertical and horizontal lines. And they'll do those things before they add in the details, because it's too much information to process all at once. So you want to take the big picture and work from there. That is exactly what this little guy did not do, right? He started over here on the edge, and then he drew this blue rectangle here, if you can see it, excuse me, triangle, this blue triangle up in the corner. Um, and I would bet that you didn't even perceive this as a distinct separate triangle. I bet you, you just saw this as part of the bigger figure. But for him, it was separate. And in fact, this thing that I was referring to as the X for him is six different lines. 
So suddenly what he did here is even more impressive because he really pulled this thing together in a major way, despite the fact that he built it one little piece at a time. And what I think is important about this is what happens when I take the figure away and I say, now draw what you just copied. And this is all he can give me. And we could look at this and say, A, that kid has a terrible memory, but we know he doesn't because he's a rock star mathematician with a huge vocabulary. We could say, B, he's not trying. I teach him something one day and he comes back the next day and he can't give it back to me. Or we could say, C, he has really bad organization and integration skills. And so if it's in front of him, he can um, give me that big chunk of information. But once I take it away, he hasn't learned it in such a way that he can remember it. And that's an organization problem. And that's an integration problem. And that's something that we want to think about when we see these kids who don't get their ideas onto paper, who do so much better when it's more structured and seem to fall apart on the field trip or in the lunchroom or in these settings where they don't have enough structure to guide their behavior, who don't set goals, who don't connect tonight's homework with the fact that they're planning to be a rocket scientist or a brain surgeon um, you know, when they grow up. Um, and who seem like they're not trying to show their knowledge. That may well be an underlying cant where they really struggle with that bigger picture thinking, with stepping back and seeing the big picture. And for these kids, they're at risk for very poor generalization. These are the kids that don't learn from their mistakes, that you feel like you're teaching the same thing over and over again. Um, and they're also kids who will get stuck on unimportant details. And so it's essential that they have accommodations that support their big picture thinking, whether that's putting new information in a familiar context, explicitly reviewing inferences, providing extra structure, but also breaking things down. So we wanna emphasize the big picture, the goal, and then we wanna break it down into a recipe or a rule or routine. So for a kid like this, it's like the big picture, the goal is you're gonna learn long division. Okay, now I'm gonna give you a checklist or a recipe that gives you that step-by-step -step so you can actually learn the skill in the way that you do best. Um, these uh, kinds of accommodations are also about providing more structure to help them show what they know on testing and also supporting their ability to be more aware of how they present in other groups. These skills, this less likely to integrate kind of person, this person who can lose the big picture has strengths around processing details. And again, that's something we want to remember. The Sherlock Holmeses of the world are detail processors and they have a role to play, especially if we can support them with those checklists or recipes or routines. So making that big picture explicit is a fundamental accommodation. It's the wheelchair ramp that we need to put in for people who struggle with organization and integration problems. In terms of uh, one last area of executive functioning that I want to talk about, it's this working memory and planning problem. And I'm going to do this very quickly and just say that there are people who have problems with planning, but also often associated with that, they're not so good at holding information in mind. And what that means is that they are they can hear a direction, they can understand it, they know what you've said to them, but they don't keep track of it to guide their own behavior. They look like kids who are choosing not to follow directions or to work independently. That's a very difficult kind of a problem to have in a large classroom. But we need to figure out if that could possibly be a cant for them that's about keeping track of what you've said. And that experiment you can do to figure out if it's a cant or a won't by providing the accommodation. And that in this case, the accommodation is really writing it down. Buy a bunch of whiteboards. <laughs> Give people concrete visual examples of what it is that you're asking them to do in writing or in pictures so they don't have to keep track of it in their head. And here I'm going to turn this over to Lynn, who's going to talk to you a little bit more about some specific um, examples of accommodations there, as well as some global accommodations. Thank you, Lauren. Yeah. So in line with this idea that we want to write more and talk less, one of the easy ways we can do this is the use of a flowchart. And breaking something, a uh, an example of 
where you're priming a student or your child or you're debriefing about a situation that may have happened. And you're going to take that information and you're going to make it visual. This is a, a really easy strategy you can use where you grab that whiteboard, you grab that piece of paper, and you're getting a child ready to go out on the playground. And they're not quite sure what they want to do when they get there, but you know they've had some challenges in the past. So you might flowchart out what one option might be where they get stuck and what that outcome might look like for them if they choose that option, and then outline what alternatives may be. This is also really nice once a child has had a challenging moment to use as a debriefing opportunity where you uh, chart out what has happened, what alternatives may have been, and what's really empowering for kids is they can go through and they can X off areas where they'd like to make a different decision in the future. And that cognitively, that visually represents the choices they can make in the future. As we build upon that strategy of talking less and writing more, um, Lauren highlighted all of the, the strategies that we can use for that, the, the whiteboards, the post-its. Um, just this morning, I had a child who was having difficulty transitioning to his next work group. And it was clear that the activity that that teacher had done the day before was, was giving that child anxiety. And he was fearful that he was going to be asked to do the same thing again today. So instead of overloading with additional language, I just pulled out a post-it note and wrote the three steps of what he was going to be doing um, that day in group. I think something that's essential when you do a strategy like that, when you take it from the verbal to the written, is to offer something enticing at the end. So they know once they've made that transition, once they've gotten over that hurdle, that there's something preferred at the end. Um, and for this particular student, it was the ability to access a book once he had moved through those strategies. But just that act of, um, of pulling out the verbal and writing that down for him allowed him to get over that hurdle. So another one of the accommodations that as educators and parents that we can introduce into our environment is this idea of keeping it positive. And research suggests right now that we would like that we should be keeping our praise to correction ratio at a four to one. And what that means is that for every piece of corrective feedback that we offer a child, we want to balance that with four pieces of praise. And so that seems like a lot. And at first it will feel like a lot. But what's amazing about this strategy is that you're going to change the culture. You're going to change the feeling in your environment. This positivity, showing kids and telling kids what you would like to see from them changes their behavior and it also changes the climate of your classroom. What's also really nice about this praise to correction recommendation is that it doesn't always have to be verbal. And we know, as you know, we've just discussed, that oftentimes we're overloading our kids with all of the verbal demands of the day. So praise can be a high five, it can be a smile, it can be a thumbs up. It is some way of acknowledging that the behavior they're displaying is, um, is the desired behavior. I think what's also important to note here is that oftentimes when we give a piece of corrective feedback, we're looking for a child to display the, the corrected behavior in its complete and, and perfect way. Praise can be offered and should be offered when a child is making a, an attempt towards a behavior. So if we've asked a child to return to their seat to get started on their work and they step up and make their start to make their way towards their chair, we can go ahead and praise their efforts for getting there. If they get to their desk and they still haven't picked up their pencil, go ahead and, and praise them for getting back to their seat and sitting calmly. Now let's go ahead and pick up that pencil. So we can praise the approximation of the behavior to get that momentum flowing in the right direction as well. So Brenda Smith-Miles, uh, who's an expert in the autism field and an occupational therapist, has a, um, a bell curve um, which identifies and illustrates the rage cycle. And so we've talked a lot about what causes overload in our students with executive functioning weaknesses. And we know that what this can look like in our kids is uh, anxiety, it can look like impulsive behavior, and it can even result in some pretty significant meltdowns. And so as we think about how these behaviors play out, what these situations look like, um, 
in the classroom or at home, we it's important to recognize what that cycle looks like for our kids. So there's that teachable moment. That's the, when the, the child is calm, they are ready and able to receive the information that they are being given. Then something happens, something challenges their executive function, something starts to um, make them become overwhelmed. And that's when we start to see a rumbling stage. And I think as teachers, we can be detectives in figuring out what does that rumbling look like for our students. This is going to be our best place for intervention. Rumbling can look like tapping, you know, a pencil on a desk. It can become, it can look like becoming fidgety in your chair. It can look like leaving the space. Um, it can look like inattention. Any of those um, can be signals that something is overwhelming or overloading your student. Once that rumbling increases, most, a lot of times our students move into the rage phase. And this can look like extreme anxiety. Some students leave the space. Some have more extreme meltdowns. What's important to note about the rage phase of this bell curve is that they are unavailable for learning in this time. And our, our job as educators and support staff in their environment is just to keep them safe and keep ourselves safe. Then after rage subsides, we enter a period of recovery. It's important to note in this stage that this period of recovery can take minutes, it can take hours, it may even take days. Oftentimes our students aren't going to be ready to process the situation or debrief about what went wrong or think about a different strategy until much later after the situation has taken place. At this stage, we're just looking for calm and re-entry into the environment to get them back into the groove and um, what they're expected to do. And it may be a day or two later that you're able to process the situation. And then from there, we enter back into that teachable moment. So now we're just gonna dig a bit deeper into some of the strategies that are presented in Unstuck and Untarget as we think about ways that we can support our kids with their executive function weaknesses. So all of the, the strategies in Unstuck and Untarget follow these four principles and are critical, and these four principles are critical in uh, the success of the strategies and teaching our students these new skills. So Unstuck and Untarget is uh, built around key scripts that we teach the students and that we um, embed into the lessons that they learn and then the everyday language of the teachers and therapists in their environment and that we also share with families. By making this language consistent across all of their settings, we are making their expectations clear and predictable and routine. And that this language um, and these expectations um, become clear for everybody who's working with the children. We also teach by doing. So not only do we have these explicit lessons where we're illustrating each of these, um, these skills and we're giving lots of practice opportunities, we as the teachers in their environment are their coaches and we live by the principle of living aloud our own experiences in life. So if you encounter a moment in your day when you're feeling particularly stuck or you're having trouble um, let's say managing the technology in the classroom and you're feeling frustrated, you're gonna live that experience aloud for the children by saying things like, I am feeling really frustrated right now. I wish I could just take this computer and throw it in the trash, but I won't because I would get in trouble, principal would be really mad, and then we would never have the computer to do lots of the fun things I'd like to do later. So right now, I'm gonna take a deep breath and I'm going to think of my plan B. What can we do to keep this lesson going if our computer isn't working? You're living aloud those experiences that we experience day in and day out and allowing children to see that you too are accessing these strategies. The other piece that's really critical, important to the components of Unstuck and Untarget are our visual supports. And Lauren has spoken um, about many of these, including checklists, the um, cues that we give our kids um, 
and strategies like using the whiteboards. So the visual supports are offered in the activities that we do, but we also have visuals that then can be displayed in your classroom. And I'm gonna give you some of, um, show you what some of those look like here in just a second. And then most importantly, we want to make this fun. As often as possible, use humor. Build on those things that are motivating and important to your children. I have one student this year who really struggled with the transition into school and experienced a lot of anxiety around it. He is a American Revolution Constitution early uh, history nut. And so as we talked about the different, the routines that um, are embedded in coming into school and ways to ease that anxiety, we sat down together and we wrote a constitution that outline the steps of coming into school. And so by tapping into his area of interest, we were able to make this overwhelming experience of entering the school a little bit more tolerable and less anxiety producing. We also um, work live by this philosophy of scaffolding our students in the areas that they need the most support. So providing the most level of support to get them to access the curriculum or the activity, fading that support as the student is, is ready, and then generalizing um, those strategies into other areas of their day. So if we use this arrival routine as an example, there are so many executive functions that impact abil a child's ability to do so successfully. So for a child who's, who's struggling, and we might provide um, pictures of them doing the steps of their arrival routine. We might then pull back those pictures once that becomes a little bit more um, automatic and just provide a checklist. And as the support teacher in the environment, we might just offer a gesture towards that checklist to remind them that it's there as a support strategy. Then as those, those steps become automatic and um, they then, uh, gain those abilities, we're going to take those skills to other areas of their day, like their pack-up routine or um, uh, gathering their gym clothes after gym class, um, but taking those and making sure that they're, they're generalized into other areas. So the feelings target is a really critical component of the unstuck and on target curriculum, and it's something that we uh, introduced very early on um, in the curriculum. We start by helping children identify emotions. And so we work through a, a set of emotion words and making sure that students have a working knowledge of what those words are. And then we talk about how emotions, there is a gradation of every emotion. And we share these emotion words with the kids and we have them assign those emotion words on these different levels of the target. Um, so we might say to the students, riding a roller coaster as an example, and then they can choose from that set of emotion words, is this something that makes me feel happy? Is this something that makes me feel terrified? And talking about how there are different emotions for different settings and that different people experience emotions in different ways. We also talk about how um, when we are experiencing emotions at the level one or level two area, we are best suited to learn, we're best suited to interact with our peers, and we are most successful when we're in this range. As we move to the farther uh, outside rings of the circle, it becomes harder to stay with the group. It became, becomes harder to manage our, our bodies and our behavior. And so after students have identified what that gradation of emotions looks like for them and the experiences that they have in their own lives that cause them to feel more intense emotions, we then dig into those strategies that they can use to help them bring them from a level five or a level four back into that green or blue zone, the level one and level two, to help them um, uh, get ready to learn or um, to interact with their peers. And as I mentioned, um, the visuals that are included in an unstuck and on target, the feelings target is one of those. And we encourage teachers and parents to put this poster front and center in the classroom. And it can be used as a dialogue 
um, throughout the day about where anyone's emotions are in a given moment. It's also a really nice way to um, to think about emotions as you're um, reading through literature and um, helping kids practice those skills as they think outside of themselves um, with others, like in a, a situation like a book. From once we've um, spent some time with the feelings target, then we move into the feelings chain. And we talk about the idea that events cause feelings. Feelings then cause actions. But we have a choice about the action that we choose to have. So in this event here, the power is out and you can't watch TV. That would leave many of us feeling furious. And feeling furious is okay. It is how we choose to react with that furious feeling that makes the big difference. So in this, this example here, the child yells and stomps their feet. Well, that action is gonna cause feelings in others, and it's also gonna cause consequences for you. So in this situation, it's gonna cause others to feel frustrated. Likely you're gonna lose your opportunity for dessert, and that's gonna leave you feeling more disappointed. So as we work through examples like this, we can talk about going back up that chain experiencing that moment of feeling furious and choosing a different action. And how that action, a more positive reaction, a more neutral reaction will cause different feelings in others, oftentimes lead to a more positive consequence for you and therefore leaving you feeling more positive. Another critical component of Unstuck and on Target is teaching why to be flexible. This is where we establish that motivation. What, what's in it for me when I choose flexibility? And we start with a very concrete example of physical flexibility. When we have a flexible body, there is so much more we can do. We can get up that jungle gym. We can crawl under that table or over that ramp. Um, when we have flexible bodies versus rigid and we do an obstacle course that illustrates what that looks like. We also dig into what happens when what you want is impossible because sometimes that's just the fact of life. Something is not available. And so how do we manage that? And how do we still get something that we are interested in by being flexible? We, use, we um, teach this point by using a pie chart that the idea of getting part of what you want is better than getting nothing at all. If we choose the option to be stuck when what we want is unavailable, we get nothing. Likely it's boring, we're sad, we're disappointed. But if the pizza restaurant was closed and you're flexible and you, cho you choose hamburgers instead, yet you didn't get pizza and you didn't get stuck and you're still getting an, an option that you enjoy and something is definitely better than nothing. So we try and make that as visual for our kids as possible. Another way that we illustrate the power of flexibility is with the story of Silly Putty and establishing why this was important as well as one of our most important scripts, Plan A and Plan B. Um, and so very quickly, the story is that during World War II, there was a shortage of rubber and an inventor named James Wright wanted to invent a substitute for rubber. He created a rubber-like substance. However, it couldn't be used for tires or boots as he had intended. So here's where the decision-making point, point comes for this inventor. He could choose to be stuck, as he did, or like Peter Hodgson did, he came along found the substance in the recipe and thought of a ton of different things that that substance could be used for. So we illustrate the point that the first inventor chose, uh, got stuck in his decision making, somebody else came along and we talk about the endless options that came out of that flexible decision. And the most fun part of it all is the fact that the kids then get to take their own turn at making silly putty and exploring all of the wonders of that flexible beautiful substance. So I mentioned the self-regulatory scripts that we use and that are kind of the, um, the backbone of the framework of Unstuck and Untarget. Those scripts not only are a consistent presence and predictable and have a clear set of expectations for our 
our children, but they also allow us to pull back from all of that talking that we do and use a familiar um, script. They alert our children to the big picture or the end goal of what we're trying uh, to get to. It's building an alliance. You've got a bond with that child about around that script. You're, you're collaborating versus dictating. And um, a critical uh, point to mention here is that they need to be practiced. They need to be explored in a variety of different situations. So here are the key scripts that um, are a part of Unstuck and Target. Flexible, unstuck, compromise, plan A and plan B. And before I um, move on to the next slide here, I'd like to highlight that compromise is one of the trickier ones, especially for us adults in the world. Oftentimes when we ask a child to compromise, we're saying, please give up your way and adopt mine. But what compromise means and what we teach our children is that compromise is where both people get some of what they want. We address big deal and little deal, the idea of choice and no choice and handling the unexpected. So in big deal, little deal, something um, important to note here is that we're not going to qualify what's a big deal for you versus a big deal for me. I'm going to acknowledge that this in this time feels like a big deal to you and together we're gonna work to make that a little deal. And then in life, there are things that are a choice and there are things that are not a choice, like taxes or going to the doctor. Those will fall in the no choice category. And we're gonna think about strategies that are going to have, that are going to make them easier um, for the, the child to work through. And then handling the unexpected. For as routine and predictable as we try and make the environment, oftentimes the unexpected happens. And how can we handle that? What will change? What will stay the same? And how can I manage that experience? And here is a very quick video of a teacher um, from the DC schools using plan A, plan B uh, in his everyday teaching language. I don't, if, uh, I'm not sure how clear the video is here, but he's um, working with a, um, a chart paper. Play the video, please. Paper from last week. It was the last one. Why didn't you just write on the board? My plan A was to use the next sheet, and then it wasn't there. Yeah. And I had to change it, and I went to go get a pad. And the other pad I had in there that was new, it was upside down, and all the paper was rippled. And the, the pad was ruined. So then my plan B didn't work. So then I needed a plan C. So I put it back up, and I just taped up the paper. Did it work out OK? Yeah. 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 It's just a little deal, right? All right. I. I'm not going to read the blue part, because we've done that already. We're going to read through the black. So I share that video because it just illustrates how easy it is to integrate this language into your everyday teaching. Another key script in the uh, curriculum is goal, why, plan, do, check. And this is this idea that we're always working towards a goal. It can be an academic goal, a social goal. It can be a long-term goal. It could be a short goal. We help the children identify what that goal is. The why is this opportunity to explore what's in it for them. Why is this, why is achieving this goal motivating? Um, so this goal here is to have fun at recess. Recess is my free time. And then we're going to establish the plans. What is my plan A? What am I going to do if plan A doesn't work out? And you can go as far as plan Z. Um, and it's just creating an opportunity for children to uh, become flexible and making the idea of having to be flexible, routine, and predictable because it's laid out for them. The do is just is just that, it's just following the plans. And then there's a reflection part where children can reflect on whether they were able to meet their goal, which of their plans worked, where did they end up having to get to, celebrating the need to get to that plan Z, and is there anything about it that they would do same or different next time? What's really nice about this framework is that it can be used at any time in any place throughout the academic or throughout the school day. It can be used to set up a lesson plan. It can be used um, to set up an activity. It can be used to prime a child for going to the playground. 
and there, the opportunities for Goal White Plan to check are endless. Here are some uh, phrases that you can use to incorporate the, this idea of goal, why plan, do, check into your everyday language and reinforce uh, students' goal-directed and planful behavior. Here's just an, another example of what that could look like for a kiddo who, uh, whose area of interest was detectives. And finally, a goal, uh, a video of an instructor using goal, why plan, do, check. Stevie, how did your math test go? Not very well. Um, I didn't. Ha I couldn't find my notes, and just I didn't, didn't know what I was doing, so I just kind of do my test as well as I wanted to. Uh, that must have been really frustrating. Okay, so I'm wondering, is this a way that we could use goal, why, plan, do, check? I think it is. Okay, let's let's do it. Okay, so you said. Your disorganized notebook got in the way of your studying for your test? Yeah. Okay. So how would you state this goal? Um, I want to reorganize my notebook so that I can find my notes and do well and get a good grade. Okay. So organize your notebook. And specifically, it sounds like you need to organize your notebook so that you can find mm -hmm. what you need when you need it. Great. All right. And how would you describe your why? How would you word it? Why is that important to you? It's important because I really want a good grade. And mm -hmm. when I get a good grade, it makes me happy. So I like being happy. I like it when you're happy, too. OK. So what do you think step one of the plan could be? Um, take all of my unfinished papers and put them in my folder. OK. All right, and then, because your pocket folder has a pocket on each side, right? Mm -hmm. So what side? I think my left side, I'm going to put my schoolwork okay. and label it schoolwork. And on my on the right side, I'll put homework. I'll put my homework there and label it homework. On the right side? On the right side. So we'll do homework on right side. And I heard you say label. Yeah, label. I think that's a great idea. So we're going to put that as part of the plan, too, that we're going to label. And I heard you say that you're going to take all of your unfinished papers and put them in your folder. And I know it sounds like it can get pretty busy and time can be kind of crunched. Mm -hmm. So what do you think about making a plan B? I think because I won't have enough time to put it in my folder, I'll just carry it to the next class, to the next class. and then okay. put it in there. Okay. Great. When do you think you can start this? Hopefully um, Friday, or maybe on the weekend, because then I'll have a fresh start on the- On Monday? On Monday, so. Okay, then you usually bring your folder yeah, home. Yeah, I do usually bring it home. Yeah, and we'll just make sure we get all the labels in there, and you'll be ready to start on Monday. Yeah. And then we'll check, and- If we'll check on by the end of next week and see if it worked. All right. Okay. Great plan. Yeah. Let's give it a try. Okay. Okay. So you can see that Stevie is a special boy and has a lot. Uh, this wasn't his first opportunity with Goal Why Plan Do Check. Um, but what's really important, I think, about in showing this video is not only illustrating what the process looks like, but seeing how what it looks like when you involve the student and getting their investment and buy in. And then they feel like they have ownership of that plan. I'd like to turn it back over to Lauren so she can talk to you about the outcomes of our study. Thanks, Lynn. Um, so, and thanks to all of you guys who are hanging in there. I know we've run over time. I'll just take about five minutes or so to share with you some of the evidence um, that supports that Unstuck and Untarget actually changes kids' lives. Um, and the first um, trial that we ran was a randomized controlled effectiveness trial in public schools. So the, we were in the DC metro area um, in several large um, county schools. And we compared Unstuck in this case to Jed Baker's social skills curriculum 
and we um, made sure that we gave exactly the same dose of intervention to both groups of kids. So we um, provided parent training, we provided um, teacher training, we provided interventionist supervision and fidelity monitoring equally, whether the for, for the groups that the 47 kids were in that were on stuck groups and for the groups that the 20 kids were in that were um, social skills group. These kids were seven to 11 years old. They were in elementary school. And the interventionists were all kinds of school staff. It wasn't any particular, you know, school psychologists. There were a few school psychologists. There were special educators, counselors, all kinds of school staff provided these interventions. And one of the really cool things was they did it with fidelity. And I think that's a real testament to, um, you know, in particular Lynn's work as a teacher in the way the curriculum is structured, it's very usable. And so there's not a lot um, of difficulty in just picking it up and making it work. So when, after um, providing these in these public schools uh, to these 67 total kids, in this case, all of whom had autism, we wanted to know if we had changed any important outcomes for them. So this graph shows in red, the unstuck kids, and in blue, the kids who got the social skills intervention. And over here on the left side, what you can see is what their scores were before the intervention. And then on the right side, what their scores were after the intervention. And in this case, the scores are on something called the block design subtest of the Wexler abbreviated scale of intelligence. So this is actually an IQ measure. It's timed visual problem solving. And remember, executive functioning is about how efficient you are with things. If you get stuck, if you don't see the big picture, um, if you have trouble keeping track of what you're doing, you're, you're less efficient. And in this case, what we saw was a significant improvement for the kids who went through unstuck in their, basically their nonverbal IQ as um, measured by this block design subtest. The kids who went through social skills, they didn't change significantly. Um, so that was pretty impressive to us. You know, we don't, as psychologists, expect to change kids' IQ. Um, and we were excited to see that. But in some ways, we were even more excited with these data. And these are blinded classroom observations. So we um, had research assistants, and they didn't know whether kids had gotten social skills or whether they'd gotten unstuck, but they sat in the back of the kids' classrooms, their mainstream classrooms, not where they were getting interventions, but where uh, unstuck or, or social skills. This was just like math class or English class or any academic setting. And they observed the kids and they um, coded their behaviors and they rated whether they were following the rules, whether they were making transitions, whether they were getting stuck, whether they were negative or overwhelmed, and whether they were participating in class. And then we looked at what happened um, in terms when we compared these behaviors in the kids before the intervention and then after the intervention. And what we saw here was that the kids who got unstuck, 60, more than 60% of them improved in their ability to follow rules, to make transitions, and to engage in reciprocal social interactions. More than 40% were better about not getting stuck, and more than 30% were better about not being negative and participating. And social skills, it helped kids too, but it helped smaller percentages of kids. We had thought that because it was social skills intervention, that this would be more helpful to kids on this reciprocity idea, that they would, the kids who got the social skills intervention would, would show more improvement than the kids who got unstuck in terms of their social reciprocity and interacting with others. In fact, that wasn't the case. The two interventions performed statistically equivalently around building those social skills, but unstuck did better than social skills on all the other um, markers. Uh, that are really about your availability for learning in the classroom. This is really asking the question, can kids follow rules, do what the teacher says, and avoid getting really negative or upset when things um, are not quite what they expect. And what we saw was that the kids who did unstuck were much more available for, for um, learning in the classroom. And that got us really excited because that's a very nice generalization of the skill that they learned in those small groups to where they really need it, which is in that everyday mainstream setting. So that inspired us to go ahead with a second study. And here 
we went beyond autism and we targeted kids with ADHD as well. So these were third to fifth graders. And these are kids in low income Title I schools. So these are, um, you know, communities that are under resourced and, and harder to make change typically in. And we went to the schools, the, these are again, public schools in the DC area. We went to the school teachers and we said, tell us which kids you think have autism or ADHD and are inflexible. And they identified kids that they thought would, would benefit from the intervention. And this time, instead of the social skills comparison that we did last time, um, we kind of upped the ante and we really did um, what we created a, a contingency behavior management, you know, program that was targeted to specifically improve flexibility as well as other executive functions. And we compared unstuck to that. So we compared something unstuck that has the cognitive behavioral techniques to these gold standard, you know, standard of care behavioral techniques that are used in most schools, but we did a really intensive intervention, again, matched for intensity of services. Both interventions were targeting executive function, and we wanted to see how they performed on those key classroom behaviors I was telling you about before, the ability to um, participate in class, to follow the directions, not to be negative, those six behaviors. And this graph shows you for unstuck, UOT is unstuck and on target. And it shows you the kids with autism over here on the left and the kids with ADHD on the right. And it's com it's a scatter plot that's comparing what their score was at the end after they had the intervention to their score at the beginning before the intervention. The pre-score is on the x-axis and the post-score is on the y-axis. These blue lines all represent a kid who had a better performance after the intervention than before. The red lines indicate a kid who had a worse performance. And what you can see is there's a lot more green, excuse me, I think I said blue, but I meant green. The blue lines are kids who didn't change. But the, the green lines show that a lot more kids with autism and a lot more kids with ADHD were doing better at the end of receiving the unstuck intervention than they were at the beginning. And I think it's important that we show you these red lines too, because there is no intervention that helps every single kid in every single year of their life, right? These kids have all kinds of things going on. And so sort of full disclosure, it's not like, you know, it's a guaranteed magic bullet for every single kid you try it with. But we, we were pretty excited to see this many kids improving in these tough school settings um, when, when they received unstuck and on target. And the fact that it didn't matter what their diagnosis was led us to believe that what was most important was um, that we were helping kids who had flexibility problems. And then we thought this is really a trans diagnostic um, intervention. It isn't that it's just for a certain kind of kid. It's for a kid who has issues around flexibility and organization. When we looked at the uh, another measure um, this is a, a measure that we give in the lab where we challenge kids' flexibility. We're actually kind of mean and we do things like, um, you know, ask them what they want to make out of Play-Doh and then they pick something and we say, no, I want to make that and sort of try to challenge them with flexibility challenges. Again, we saw nice improvements for most kids with ASD and ADHD um, following the unstuck and on-target intervention. So there is some good blinded, randomized controlled evidence for this intervention. Um, I, along with everyone else on the authorship team, are happy to hear from you if you have questions. Um, and we also want you to know that in addition to the um, kit, there is that other book, Solving Executive Functions, and soon to be released online, E Unstuck, which are online training modules designed for parents um, to help them learn these techniques. Because again, like Lynn was saying, the magic of, of Unstuck and on Target is that it's kind of contagious. When you start using these words like big deal, little deal, plan A, plan B, consciously, and all the adults in the child's life are using the same words, we find that they get picked up by everybody. And the same thing with the feelings target. And they sort of become part of the culture in which the kid is living, whether that's home or school or other places. And boy, do kids love that when they hear the same kinds of approaches across these different settings. So um, I'm going to close there and just say thank you so much for hanging in. Um, and I think I'm going to turn it back over to the um, uh, web organizers here. Hi again. Thank you, Lauren and Lynn. And thank you, everyone, for staying on with us. Um, 
I'd just like to go through the last few things. We're going to do a reminder to use savings code EDWEBLC to receive 20% off any orders on birthpublishing.com. That expires October 31st. And I'd also like to announce our winner. Our winner today is Glenda Moore from North Carolina, and I will be contacting you shortly within the next couple days. And then again, thank you to our presenters, Lynn and Lauren. We honestly learned so much today. Um, I'm glad that we were able to do everything within this time. And it sounds like everyone really enjoyed learning from you both. Again, don't forget to get your CE certificate from this webinar. If you're watching with us live, you will get an email to you at the next 24 hours. If you're joining us by phone or watching this on demand, please take the CE quiz located in the archive and you'll get one email to you. Uh, join us for our next webinar next month, Resolving Tough Individual Student Behavior Challenges with Prevent, Teach, Reinforce with Dr. Rose Ivanon. Um, that'll be October 23rd at 3 p.m. And of course, join our community teaching all students. It's a free community at edweb.net, inclusive education. Oh no, it seems my Q&A slide disappeared. Oh, I'm sorry, I went right past it. Okay, so Q&A. So Lynn and Lauren, I'm gonna ask you a few questions that people submitted throughout the webinar. And um, I'll just pick some and, let you, and you can go ahead and answer them freely, okay? Sure. So how, how do we help students to monitor the stresses of their day? No, oh, that's a big one. That is. Yeah. I'll just dive in and say, um, you know, that feelings target turns out to be kind of magical. Um, and just like words like big deal, little deal, that one, two, three, four, five becomes kind of part of a culture. And we've seen a number of schools where we've run our research trials decide that actually all the kids in the school, not just the kids in the small group intervention, are going to learn certain components of unstuck. And they'll often push it in, like say the counselor might come into the classroom once a month to um, do sort of like friendship building, good citizenship stuff. And they'll introduce things like the feelings target. And that really can go a long way for kids to start to be able to talk about, I'm not feeling good. I think I'm a four, you know, what can I do? And what's really exciting to me is when you hear two kids kind of helping each other a little bit with that, like, gee, I'm a four, like what, maybe you need to talk to the teacher or, you know, what's the next thing to, to try? Absolutely. And just to piggyback on that, I think what's really neat is when it becomes part of the language and students freely are, are labeling uh, their level of emotion at different times during the day, you can reflect on that and say, you know, when we started math yesterday, you know, that really, you acknowledge that that felt like a 40 you. What strategy do you think we can use today to help bring us back down to a level one or a level two? And so they start to acknowledge where those stressors are popping up during their day. And a lot of times they're very consistent from day to day. And then you can employ more consistent strategies to help them manage them on a day to day basis. OK, great. Yeah. Um, let's go on to the next question. How do you balance the need for being flexible with the need for routine and predictability? I think that is a, a really great question um, and one that teachers ask all of the time um, because there is there is no end to the opportunities for being flexible during the day. Um, and because that is true, I think as often as we can make the schedule um, routine and predictable, we're going to alleviate that stress on the executive function system. Um, but as we all know, um, life is full of unpredictable uh, moments. And so what we're gonna do for the kids is make our, our strategies for managing that unpredictability, that unexpected event, what's consistent, routine, and predictable. So when an unexpected event happens, we pause, we acknowledge it, and then we can do something like enter into our discussion about big deal, little deal. All right, we've got we've got a strategy for when the unexpected happens. We're going to problem solve that together. Or if the unexpected happens, we're going to write out a goal. Why plan do check? We're going to say, OK, our goal was to to get to recess today, but it's rained. So what are our plan A's, plan B's, plan C is going to be so we can accomplish that goal in some form or fashion? So acknowledging that the unpredictable 
um, happens. There's a need for flexibility, um, but we're going to keep our responses to it, the strategies the kids use as the routine and the, the structured predictable um, option. Okay, awesome. Um, are children's executive functioning skills compromised who have, who have experienced adverse childhood experience? So I'm assuming trauma, traumatic events. Yes. Yeah, this is this is one of the reasons we wanted to do our second trial in low income schools. Um, and it's striking how we can set a child's executive functions off on the wrong track by introducing stress into their lives. And so even at the level of just living in poverty, whether or not you're you know, abused or um, traumatized directly, that fact of having income insecurity in the first uh, four years of your life um, has a direct and linear impact on your executive functions. Trauma is also very bad for executive functions, um, as is frankly depression um, and anxiety. Uh, it's one of the most distributed and sensitive networks in the brain. So there's just so many ways you can derail executive function, which is why I think this intervention becomes sort of contagious. I mean, people say, oh, I'm using it with my mother-in-law, you know, <laughs> I'm using it with my dog, you know, whatever it is. I mean, most of us have trouble with some aspect of executive function. Okay. Um, so I know that Unstuck and Untarget uses a second grade level um, reading reading level, but do you have any suggestions on how to adapt it to use with people with limited verbal ability who are not fluent users of speech generating devices or low tech boards? Um, so it, Unstuck and Untarget is a language intense curriculum. Um, and so uh, much of the activities and the scripts that we use um, necessitate that the students do have, you know, somewhat intact language to be able to understand and use um, that language. That's not to say that students with lower reading levels um, or even younger age students than the ones that we've designed the curriculum for can't access the content and the material or the topics. Um, it would just require uh, the types of modifications that you would do for the students in any other area of um, their um, their school curriculum. So using visuals, um, picture cues, um, modifying language, um, all of those strategies um, can make this, this, this content accessible for students of a variety of different levels. Yeah, I would just add that a lot of uh, schools that we're uh, aware of, uh, people have started to adapt on stuff for those kindergarten and first grade uh, groups. And um, we're also in the process, and Lynn is, of thinking about it for preschoolers. And, you know, there's some things that are easier to translate than others. Um, that idea of being flexible, that's something that a three-year-old gets and loves. I've, I've used it in my own kid's preschool. <laughs> you know, it makes a big difference when you're trying to get into circle time and you, the kid can't sit next to who they want to if you start really praising being flexible. Um, something like goal, why, plan, do, check, a lot of people choose to abbreviate. It's like, well, you know, we need a plan to get to our goal, you know, and you can you can just use the language like that um, individually. We have started to think about making visual cues for some of these things, you know, so compromise, there's the red color and then there's the blue color and then the purple is the compromise, you know, those kinds of things, but we have not published that stuff yet. And it's kind of a, a next step for us, I think. I, just as a, an addition and aside to that, when um, offering these strategies to the younger set, picture books are really um, easy, accessible way to access so many of these key strategies um, and scripts. Okay, great. Um, so I guess we'll end it with one more question. How do you even begin to break through with students who totally shut down 100% of the time with even the most minor feedback or frustration? Um, the, sh the short answer I would give is to find what is motivating for them. Where is their area of interest? Build that rapport, establish that, that relationship, model the scripts and the behavior in your own life and your own behavior so that they can see it first in you and it doesn't feel so personal initially. Um, 
But as I mentioned earlier, kind of tapping into that area of interest, meeting with them where they are and in something that's interesting to them. Um, and once that rapport, that relationship's been established, you've got them, you've got them hooked with that area of interest. Um, it opens the door for kind of further in exploration into these skills. And praise the heck out of every good yes. thing they do. Yes. <laughs> okay, great. Well, thank you so much, both of you. Um, that concludes today. Uh, Lauren's email information has been updated for the slides in the archive. So we don't have to worry about that. It is now your accurate email. Anyone who's Thank looking you. to contact Lauren can do so directly. Um, and again, reminder, the code expires at the end of October, EdWebLC. And again, our winner, just to reiterate, was Glenda Moore from North Carolina. So congratulations on winning your free kit. <laughs> so um, everyone enjoy the rest of your day and we're gonna sign off. Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks.